Well, good morning to you. I am so grateful to have this opportunity to share God's Word with you. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, in our verse-by-verse study to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. So today's text for teaching is Matthew 12, beginning at verse 22 through the end of the chapter. But the key is found in verse 30. That verse says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So today our title for today's teaching is Gathering Lost Sheep with Jesus. So, in describing his outreach to tax collectors and sinners, Jesus said that he was all about gathering lost sheep. The legalistic, self-righteous Pharisees had scattered the lost sheep of Israel by demanding adherence to their impossible man-made additions and interpretations of the law of Moses, especially in regard to the Sabbath. In last week's text, Jesus was condemned by these Pharisees for healing a man on the Sabbath there in the synagogue. There was a man who had a withered hand, and Jesus healed that man. And in one account of this says that he even called him forth to come up front and stretch out his hand, and he healed him there in spite of the Pharisees being so accusative about that. So Mark's account says Jesus looked around at these Pharisees with anger, being grieved over their hardness of heart. And so afterwards, Jesus quoted from a messianic prophecy that Tony mentioned last week from Isaiah, including these words, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. Now reeds were made for Making fl- were, were for making flutes. That's what they used them for. And so it required them to be rigid, and of course they were hollowed out, and they made a flute out of it. But a bruised reed could not be used for a flute because it was, it was injured, and you couldn't make it rigid as it needed to be. And so it was useless. It was just broken off and thrown away. The smoldering wick or flax represents people who have been spiritually and emotionally weakened by something. Jesus did not discard people who had lost the spark for life. In fact, they were the most important people who ever came before him. So he was very concerned about anybody who needed to have that spark of life rekindled. So... Tradition indicates that this man with the withered hand was a mason. So can you imagine what it was like for this man that he had this withered hand and and he used his hands for his his work, for his vocation of being a mason and and lifting those stones and putting them into place and, and all of these things? You know, he was not able to do that. He must have felt absolutely useless. And so he was a smoking flax. You know, the spark of life had kind of gone out for this man. But Jesus rekindled it as he reached out his hand and touched him, and he healed him. Jesus did his ministry of gathering and restoring scattered sheep under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And now he has poured out his Spirit upon all of us. For what reason? So that we can partner with him in gathering scattered sheep to him. Perhaps the most bruised and broken people encountered by Jesus and his disciples were the demon-possessed. In Matthew 12, 22, we read about how he, uh, someone was brought to him who was demon-possessed, and someone was gathered to him who was demon-possessed. It says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Again, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would heal the blind, would heal the mute, and set free those who were held captive. In this case, 
held captive by dark spirits, satanic spirits. So the multitude began to question if this is the son of David, which was another title for the Messiah. And so the Pharisees heard that. They were deeply concerned. So they heard it and said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Now the scribes and Pharisees were desperate to discredit Jesus. So they came up with the most egregious insult and accusation. You know, when someone cannot legitimately discredit an opponent, what do they do? They often will resort to name-calling and false accusations. We see that a lot in politics these days, don't we? So these Pharisees blasphemed against the Son of God by attributing his setting free of this demonized man to be from the partnership with Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Beelzebub was the name of the, Can- name of the Canaanite fertility god, and for the Jews, synonymous with Satan. In verse 25, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So the first rebuttal that Jesus gave to these hostile Pharisees was very logical. If he is a part of Satan's household, there is a major divide in the household. How can the satanic kingdom stand if it turns against itself? And so can you imagine, for instance, can you imagine a Ford dealership being real busy on a Saturday showing cars to people and the owner of the dealership walks in and he says, there's just too many people here. You know, there's a Chevrolet dealership across the road there. Let's send half of these people over there. Well, if he did that very often, he wouldn't have a dealership to own anymore. The the dealership would be divided. And so how ridiculous it would be to think that Satan would commission Jesus to set people free from captivity to Satan. You know, doesn't make sense, does it? The second rebuttal calls into question by whom their own exorcists cast out demons. Uh, Some people are surprised to learn that there were Jewish exorcists, but there were. He says in verse 27, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, King Solomon was given wisdom by God to perform exorcisms. And over the centuries, there were Jewish exorcists who had practiced the extraction of demons by use of incantations and applications of certain herbs and plants and roots and just uh, just short of practicing magic, really. But Jesus, by his simple words... And the Spirit of God that was upon him cast out these demons, showing them that the kingdom of God had come upon them. So by the Spirit of God, he gathered in the lost sheep that Satan had controlled with dark spirits for so long. Verse 29, Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds a strong man, and then he will plunder his house? This is the third rebuttal that Jesus gave to these hostile Pharisees. So uh, he says to these blasphemous accusations of the Pharisees that perhaps this one's packed with the most meaning. The strong man, and what Jesus is saying here, the strong man of the household is Satan. And the household is the world over which he has ruled, occupied by lost and broken people, scattered sheep. Jesus is pictured as being like a thief who binds the strong man of the house, Satan, and plunders his house of those precious people who were being destroyed by, destroyed by his evil ways. So we praise God today, don't we? That because Jesus, we praise him because he has plundered us away from Satan's household, right? 
Are you, are you, aren't you glad about that? Can you say, praise the Lord for that? Hallelujah. You, God has taken me. God has stolen me away. Christ Jesus stole me away from Satan's household. And so, with the sure message of the Gospels, and Satan is disabled by that word of truth, that Satan has no jurisdiction any longer over those who have been ransomed, by the atoning death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection life given to us by his living spirit. Our chains are gone through the amazing grace of God. No incantations or magical roots were needed. I think of the lyrics written by Chris Tomlin. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Wow. <laughs> we belong to Jesus, and he has plundered Satan's household. Now, again, look at the key verse that published uh, the words of Jesus that challenged all of us who would listen to partner with him in his ministry of gathering lost and scattered sheep. And his ministry of plundering Satan's household. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Jesus is speaking directly here to these Pharisees. He is telling them that there is no fence to straddle here. They are either with him or they are against him. He is the Messiah, and their hearts were so callous toward the revelation of the truth about Jesus through the Spirit so that they were trying to scatter his followers with their blasphemous accusations. And so they would love to see just people disappear, you know, and say, and say well, Jesus is a fraud. You know, he's doing this by the power of Satan and not by the power of God. But Jesus goes on to say this in verse 31. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, against the Spirit, will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks the word against the Son of Man, will be, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Quite sobering words to those who were listening to them on that day. So let's summarize for just a moment what these Pharisees have seen and heard. They have heard John the baptizer refer to Jesus as the anointed one or the Messiah. They have heard and seen him fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. They have witnessed many miracles and healings and deliverance from demons. And finally, they have heard him teach and preach about the kingdom of heaven with great authority and anointing of the Spirit, none of which they have been able to repudiate or to challenge successfully. Yet these guys have become hardened. The more they resisted Jesus, the more hardened they became in their hearts. And so they became hardened in their resistance to Jesus to the point of accusing him of being in partnership with the devil while plotting to kill him. So, Jesus warned them that they are close, getting close to the point of no return. If they keep this up, they're not going to be able to return and make that profession of faith in him. And so he warned them about this. They are close to committing a sin which will not be forgiven, and that would be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. So let's take a closer look. For this to mean something to these Pharisees, they would be thinking about the Jewish perspective on the Holy Spirit. So according to William Barclay, the Jewish perspective was that there were two primary functions of the Holy Spirit. The first one is that the Holy Spirit is responsible for the presentation of truth to people. Okay, think about that. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the presentation of truth. The second perspective, Jewish perspective on the Holy Spirit, was that the Holy Spirit enables people to understand the truth when it is presented to them. 
So the Holy Spirit is responsible for presenting the truth and then for enabling people to understand the truth. Now, these Pharisees were not spiritually minded men, okay? They rejected the truth that was staring them right in the face. The whole time these men have been observing Jesus, the Spirit of God, has been bearing witness of the truth about him. By attributing his ministry to the devil, they are dangerously coming close to rejecting the Holy Spirit's conviction one too many times. They may reach the point where they are too hardened to repent and the Spirit of God will cease to speak to them. So their hearts and conscience will be seared to the point of no repentance. And guess what? Where there is no repentance, there is no forgiveness of sin. So does that kind of make sense to you now? What Jesus was trying to say to them? So either make the tree good, he says in verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of good treasure of his heart will bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So Jesus is telling us here that the condition of a person's heart is revealed by the words of his or her mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Pharisees had spoken some evil words about Jesus. So what does that tell you about their hearts? Their hearts were full of evil. And so that was the content of their hearts. They were like vipers ready to strike with their venomous words. So those words were like poison. And their words were meant to poison uh, the good news about Jesus in the eyes of those people who gathered around him. The objective of their evil words were to per perpetrate evil by denying healing to broken people by Jesus. Their fabricated Sabbath rules would have barred healing of the man with the withered hand. Their words would have sent this poor demoniac home without being set free. Their evil words were producing evil works. Their evil words were producing evil works. Now, words, my friends, are extremely important. They not only reveal the condition of a person's heart, but also set the stage for what a person does. Now, our words can move us in a positive direction, or our words can move us in a negative direction. If the content of the heart is not expressed verbally, there is a greater likelihood that a person can change their mind. But once the words are spoken of what's in the heart, then it's much more difficult to change a person's mind. So we really need to be concerned about the words that we speak. Uh, so uh, it's best not to speak something until we are sure of something, that we are sure that something is true and not be vain imaginations of the heart. A person can speak a lie or an exaggeration, and once it is spoken, they will eventually believe that lie. And that is what the Pharisees were doing. So, verse 36, he goes on to explain where he's coming from. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account for it, of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And of course, the, the main word by which we are not condemned and by which we are justified is that word of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. So by that word, the confession of that word, we are saved. But there are other words that are spoken that wind up condemning peoples uh, until, unless they turn to Jesus and confess him. 
Jesus tells these Pharisees that the judgment, not just actions will be judged, but also the idle words which eventually led to that action. So idle words are the result of something. They're the result of lazy thinking. Idle words are the result of not taking the time to study something, to think it through, to verify the facts, and understand what's really going on. And so when people are saying things out there and uh, in wherever they're saying them, verbally or on Facebook or whatever, and that's why we have to be very careful about posting what somebody else said on Facebook without even knowing if they've done any homework on what they're posting. Because it could be a very foolish posting, or it could be an evil posting of some kind. And so we have to be careful what we believe with idle words being spoken, or in this case, posted, or whatever. So idle words are assumptions made without evidence. They are words with no substance behind them. They are spoken without being examined thoroughly uh, in light of what is true. So to repeat second- or third-hand information is idle speaking. Some of these people may have bought into gossip that they heard about Jesus from, from among these hostile Pharisees. They may have been saying to one another, you know, he's doing this by the power of Satan. You know, or he's doing something else. And Tony mentioned in one of his messages the, the point that was made in a, a passage there that they were accusing him of being a wine bibber and a glutton. So they're going around, this gossip going around about Jesus being a wine bibber, or he might be a drunk or something, you know. So he's not being speaking out of the, out of the truth of, of God's word. And so this gossip going around that would keep people from coming to Jesus and scatter them instead of gathering them. So most people have either read or seen the movie based on the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. How many of you have read that book or you've seen a play or a movie about that? Vicki and I have watched that movie many times. You know, and uh, so uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's exactly what happened in that story. It's a sad story. An innocent man died because of idle words spreading throughout the community. And this was what was going on with these Pharisees. They were spreading idle words. And it developed into an evil plot then to kill Jesus. And so it's important to understand that spoken words can have eternal consequences. Scientists say that sound waves never die. They only diminish in intensity. And if you think about that for a minute, that the words we speak never die. They're still out there somewhere, right? And there's something kind of funny that happened uh, a number of years ago. It, 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 a news broadcast was interrupted by the song lyrics, It's Howdy Doody Time. <laughs> you know. And... Uh, from a broadcast that had occurred 30 years earlier. Now, how did that happen? Well, somebody speculated that the sound waves had hit some sort of asteroid and then bounced back to Earth, you know. And so, Howdy Doody Time, it's, it's an eternal song, you know. But here's, here's the thing. Idle words spoken today may bounce back to us down the road. Okay, According to Jesus, they would bounce back to these Pharisees on the day of judgment. Now, it's important for us to learn this lesson, isn't it? Verify what you're talking about. Know what you're talking about. If you're talking about the Bible, make sure that you're accurate <clears throat> in your presentation of what the Bible is saying. So momentarily... The Pharisees backed off and tried another approach. Verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, 
And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, nobody knew what he was talking about at that point, uh, about the Son of Man being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, he said, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Now the Pharisees presumptuously asked Jesus to do a sign. They wanted to see a sign so that they could say, yeah, maybe there's something to you after all, you know. And you know, there was another guy who asked for some signs and magic for Jesus to do, and that was Herod when Jesus was put on trial in front of Herod, you know. But the world wants a sign before they will believe. And the truth of the matter is, in a number of cities that Jesus went into and worked miracles, they would not repent. They would not have faith in him still. But Jesus tells them that they will only receive the same sign that Nineveh received You know, the Syrians of Nineveh were a cruel and a barbaric people. The only sign they received was Jonah's anointed preaching. And then they repented. They did not receive some supernatural sign or wonder. But the point is that if these hostile Pharisees would not respond to the Holy Spirit speaking through Jesus, the Son of God then neither would signs and wonders cause them to believe. Even when he rose again from the dead, after the, on the third day after he was crucified, they still would not believe. Verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. So after Jonah in Nineveh, Jesus turns to the wisdom of Solomon as an example of their unbelief. He refers to an account in 1 Kings chapter 10, where the queen of Sheba came from Africa to hear the wisdom of Solomon and was blown away by it. She had never heard such great wisdom in all of her life. And yet one is speaking truth to these Pharisees that is greater than Solomon. And yet they are accusing him and embellishing their accusations against him and refusing to believe in him. Verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So these verses take us sort of back to the original context of Jesus' exchange of words with the Pharisees that he was casting out demons by the power of Satan. This section may be directed to the Jewish rabbis who specialized in exorcism, which was like a type of magic using incantations and special herbal applications. But in that type of exorcism, there may have been some, some positive change at first, Initially followed by a return of the possession sometime later, and oftentimes worse than ever. In those cases of exorcism, there was nothing, you see, to replace the influence of that dark spirit in that person's life. Nothing to replace it. It may be that Jesus is saying that his exorcisms were permanent because they were directed by the Holy Spirit. And... uh, followed by discipleship to him. An example of this would be Mary Magdalene, who was controlled by seven demonic spirits. Jesus set her free, and she became a committed disciple. She was the first one to see Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead. 
And this deliverance that she went through, it took, you know, why? Because it was replaced by a commitment to Jesus Christ as her, her Lord, her master, her, her master teacher. She became his disciple. And so she did not have this happen to her. Another example would be the demoniac who was tormented by a legion of demons. Jesus delivered him, and he was in his right mind. And then he committed himself to be a disciple of Jesus and then went into his home city and began to tell everybody about Jesus and, and who he was, how he had delivered him. Many years ago, more years than I want to think about, I directed a Christian recovery program called Teen Challenge and which was clearly based on a commitment to Jesus Christ as the primary factor for one's successful rehabilitation from drug use. We indeed saw many miracles take place among drug addicts in that ministry. In fact, we called what was going on with those people the Jesus factor. The participants spent over a year growing in discipleship to Christ. We had daily classes several times a day, and during that time, the, the federal government did a study comparing a methadone treatment program for heroin addicts uh, to this Teen Challenge program that at that time was all over the country and eventually established all across the world. And so to, they did this study. This was the federal government doing this study. They were comparing this methadone treatment program for heroin addicts to heroin addicts who had gone through this Christ-based program. And what they learned was that five years after the program's completion, 1%, 1% of those that had gone through this methadone-based program for heroin addicts were still free from heroin. 1%. But in this Christ-based program, they discovered that 80% of the participants who had gone through this daily discipleship to Jesus and had learned about Him and their walk with Him and were committed to Christ, that 80% of those heroin addicts remained free from heroin use five years later. They called it the Jesus factor. For a while... A person can get his or her life in order, but without the strength of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and support of spiritual fellowship, most people will fall back into old destructive ways of thinking and living. But let's reflect for a moment on the last few words of verse 45. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now, who was he talking about? It seems likely that this wicked generation referred to those overcome with hatred for Jesus, that so much hatred that they accused him of being under Satan's control. Could it be that Jesus believed that they, they were the ones under the influence of Beelzebub? Likely so. If their evil hearts are not cleansed and open to the influence of God's Spirit, they will become more and more evil than ever. They will not change. They will even get worse. Did you know that this is also true about human beings who refuse to change their ways? We know that people who do harmful things to other people and if they do not repent of those things and change their ways, that by the end of their life, even in older age, they will be far worse than they were at the beginning. So what Jesus is saying here is so true. And finally, we come to an example of resistance to Jesus' ministry that's a lot closer to home. This ministry of gathering scattered sheep that is based on this, this resistance is based on good intentions, but wrong nonetheless. Matthew 12, verse 46. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside. 
seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are, you, are, are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So, what we have to understand is at this point in time, Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters had not become part of his following. They were not disciples of Jesus. They had not been around for all the things they had been doing and teaching. And so they were not his disciples. And you might even recall that the last time he was in Nazareth, his hometown, the people there tried to stone him when he described his ministry as the messianic fulfillment of Isaiah 61. He wasn't welcome in his hometown. So he couldn't go back there. He wound up going to Capernaum instead and establishing his ministry out of there. Perhaps they saw, his mother and brother saw, how Jesus' life was in danger and they wanted to rescue him. They had good intentions. But had Jesus gone with them, the gathering of lost sheep that he was doing would have been aborted. Those lost and broken people would have scattered. The good news is that these family members did eventually become believers in his mission and his followers. They became his disciples. In fact, the James, the brother of Jesus, eventually became the overseer of the church in Jerusalem and wrote the epistle we know as the epistle of James. So what does this mean for us? It is wonderful when our immediate family is sold out to Christ and is supportive of our walk with God. And, you know, I had a family like that. Uh, I, I'm several generations of believers, you know. And uh, so I was very, very blessed by that. But it can be very confusing if our family of origin does not understand or support our discipleship to Christ. They may even try to influence us away from radical discipleship, especially as the Western world, sadly, is becoming more and more agnostic. And I've witnessed this myself where parents and family members of a new Christian who, wanted, who had a fervency for the Lord were trying to put a wet blanket on that. I remember during the Jesus Movement reading an article in Life magazine about the Jesus Movement, about the founder of our fellowship of churches, Pastor Chuck Smith. And these, they quoted these parents as saying that they, they would rather their, their children go back to smoking pot than to carry their Bibles everywhere they went, that they were now addicted to the Bible. And so they were trying to discourage their children from serving the Lord. Jesus tells us something very comforting. We have not only a heavenly Father, but we also have a spiritual family. When we go through difficult times, there is a support system in place for us. We talked about that support system in our class this morning. The last word for today is that, that from which, where we started. Jesus has called us and commissioned us to partner with him in gathering scattered sheep setting free those held captive to sin and to the evil of others. Jesus said the ones who are not for him are against him. And Paul reversed that order and said, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? Very special promise in God's word. And those words were spoken or written to a very 
wonderful man in, our, in the history of our world, a guy by the name of, of uh, uh, William Wilberforce. William, William Wilberforce did something very powerful in the name of Christ. He pushed Britain's parliament to abolish the horrible evil of slavery. Discouraged, he was about to give up, and his elderly friend, John Wesley, the great preacher, John Wesley, heard of it from his deathbed, and he called for a pen and paper. With trembling hand, Wesley wrote, Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of His might till even American slavery will vanish away before it. Wesley died six days later. But Wilberforce fought for 45 more years, and in 1833, three days before his own death, saw slavery abolished in Britain. Yeah. And another cheerleader of Wilberforce's, by the way, was a guy named John Newton, a former slave cap, uh, ship cap, uh, captain of a, sh- a slave ship who gave his heart to Jesus during a storm at sea. And he became an Anglican minister, and he was Wilberforce's pastor and encouraged him strongly. And by the way, there is a movie about this called Amazing Grace because John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. As we go about in our world, let us partner with Jesus in redemptive works that set broken people free from the evils that enslave them. Those who are for Jesus and not against him will gather broken people to his redemptive touch. It's a circular thing. He gives us a redemptive mission to gather lost sheep, demonstrating that we are for him and not against him. And then he stands with us with this word of truth, like Wesley gave to Wilberforce. If God is for us, be for us, who can be against us? Perhaps none of us will take on such a magnanimous mission as the abolishment of slavery. But each lost and broken person that we encounter around us is a mission to gather him or her into the redemptive touch of Jesus and then to provide a support system for that soul's transformation. And that's what we pray for, that all of us will take that stand in our world and be a gatherer of lost sheep to Jesus. Mike Kuzma, we had this marvelous celebration of life service that we attended yesterday, and a friend of his stood up and talked about his life. He talked about how when Mike became a believer in Jesus, that uh, every person he met, he talked to them about Jesus. He wore t-shirts with scriptures on them, words about Jesus on them. And as Tony mentioned in our, in our, sun, in our Tuesday morning men's prayer group in White House, every Tuesday, Mike would ask for prayer for his brother Mitch, that he would come to know the Lord. He said, you know, Mitch, Mitch's heart is hard. He, won't, he doesn't want to hear it. But just pray for him that he will listen. And we discovered that then, as Tony shared, that Mitch indeed gave his heart to Jesus. And then... Now both of them are rejoicing together in the presence of the Lord. So Mike Kuzma was a gatherer in partnership with Jesus. Why don't we all be gatherers, bringing people to the transformative, redemptive touch of Jesus? You know people in your life that need that, don't you? Well, don't be shy about it. Tell them 
that Jesus is there for them and loves them. Don't talk to them about Christianity. Sadly, Christianity's got a bad name for a lot of people. So don't use the word Christianity to anybody. Use Jesus. And talk to people about Jesus and the good news of who he is. Let's stand together. How many of you would just raise your hand for a moment and say, I know people that are broken and away from the Lord? Okay. Well, we're going to pray for those people right now. That if, whether it's you or somebody else, that they'll be gathered in, like Mitch was, uh, that they'll be gathered in to the, to the good news that Jesus loves them and has died on that cross for them. Lord, we thank you for these hands that were raised, and I'm sure everybody here knows someone who is broken and hurting and in need of your healing touch, your restoring touch to be delivered from slavery to sin, and maybe even some people who are under the influence of dark spirits, like the man we talked about earlier. We just pray, Lord, that as, as we meet those people now, that you'll give opportunity, then you'll show us that there's an opportunity to gather them into Jesus. Show us that, Lord. And lead us to people that we don't even know that need you, Lord, that we might see a harvest of souls. In Christ's name, amen. By the way, just one word of rejoicing, too, this morning. I'm just hearing more and more about... Uh, great things happening on college campuses right now about students coming to the Lord, students having just gigantic worship services. on. These are secular campuses, most of them. Uh, gigantic worship services there. And boy, what a, what a thrilling thing that is to hear about, right? That Jesus is gathering scattered sheep on college campuses. <laughs> All right. Now, if any of you would like to have prayer this morning, you come on up to the front and we'll pray with you uh, after the benediction. And now may God bless you. May his grace be great upon you. May his peace be wonderful in your heart. And may his love overflow in you as a light to broken and scattered people around you. May people see Jesus in you so that they will come to him. In Christ's name, amen. Bless you all.